Okay, so from the top with shoes. So I, my uh, uh, approach to shoes is a little bit um, divided. So um, there's good science that says the lighter your shoes, the better. Um, every three and a half ounces, 100 grams of weight on your shoe uh, costs you about 1%. So about two and a half minutes on a four-hour marathon. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's a fairly made cost of wearing shoes and wearing heavy shoes. Um, there's a little bit of evidence that suggests cushioning may help your running economy a little bit to offset some of that weight. Um, but generally, the lighter the shoe, uh, the better. Um, so I've been a, a big fan for a long time of, of very minimalist shoes, uh, Nike free uh, shoes like that. Um, what I found though is as you transition to ultras and uh, 50 miles and beyond, then the pounding on the feet, the heavily cushioned, thick soled hokers and ultras actually seem to help. Mm -hmm. um, so for most people, I think a fairly lightweight, minimalist shoe. Um, uh, I've become a fan of um, Mizono's uh, Kurosis. Um, we sound like a disease, I know. Um, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, the Ultra One Squared, wonderful shoe. I really like it. Um, but if I'm running 100 miles, I'm probably going to be wearing something a little heavier, even yeah. though it's going to slow me up. Um, the extra protection from the pounding seems to, to make it uh, worth the wait. So I have a question on on this um i i did the minimalist thing for a long time i would say i mean i wasn't really running very much because i just had too many problems back then but i was running what i could i actually did um, my first half marathon in five fingers <laughs> uh -huh. so i mean i actually was running barefoot when the ground wasn't too hot and yeah. I, I would not advocate barefoot running on asphalt anytime actually ever but um you know, when I found I would run in grass and stuff too, grass kind of hides little holes and stuff, so I found it, it hurt my ankles. And anyway, I did the whole barefoot thing for a long time. Then I went into a minimalist shoe type thing, and it just I just found that it beat the crap out of me. And a couple of – I actually had an ultra marathon um, friend. He's done a lot of ultras, and then I have a really, really – fast marathon friend like um like a 217 guy and he's just yeah. like don't do that and i get the the whole science behind it to uh strengthen you know all your foot and your foot bones yeah. and and it all it, you also have a lot more ground feel so it makes you less reckless but um do you think that for heavier people, maybe cushier shoes are kind of a better thing to start out in to at least kind of um, get them going, you know, without too I, much I, I thrashing? Really don't I, don't, I, I don't think we know enough. Um, the, the concern with a, a thicker, more cushioned shoe is they're much more forgiving of very bad biomechanics and bad form. Yeah, I get so that. It, it makes it much easier to do things like, you know, overstriding. Um, one of the things that become less clear, however, is how much of the minimalist, maximalist kind of debate uh, is should actually be about the drop. You know, how much higher the heel is than the, the forefoot. Mm -hmm. um, my experience has been it's much harder to run with good form in a high-heeled shoe than a uh, minimal drop shoe, regardless of how thick the sole is. Mm -hmm. um, so something like the Ultra, the Ultra Olympus, you know, it's, it's a really thick-soled shoe, but it's zero drop. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't seem to have the problems I've had uh, with catching my heels that I would in something like a uh, standard Adidas. Yeah. So uh, I, I think the the sweet spot for a lot of people is going to be a, uh, a thin to moderate thickness shoe that's reasonably softly cushioned, reasonably lightweight, um, and zero drop. I think that's kind of the sweet spot. 
Yeah, it's you know it's funny because I've had uh, a couple of zero drop shoes. Um, the Brooks Pure Line um, was one that I tried, and um, I've had uh, Saucony Hattori's. I've had I don't know a few of them, obviously, and then the Five Finger stuff's zero drop. <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah. I actually haven't had much success with that, and I actually got one of my probably my second worst injury on uh, my piriformis in a in a Brooks pure shoe and I found that I'm just extremely unstable in them and even oh. even though they are kind of a stability shoe and um, actually it, it was uh, my marathon runner friend that talked me out of them and I've gone into a higher shoe um, one of the ones I've had the most success with is um, the uh, Nike Lunar series and right. they they are stable enough for me. I can actually get away running in like a Brooks Ghost, even though it's a neutral shoe. Uh, it's stable enough for me, and it actually improves my form. That said, I have um, a set of Ultras coming. Ultra sending me a pair, and I'm gonna try those out. And I wanted to try something thicker because I'm I'm starting to do more miles, and I have the yeah. other training on top of that. So you know form. I don't want to say my form can get sloppy, but if you're tired from riding a bike and swimming and stuff too, yeah. you, you're tired's tired, and yes. you know it's 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 sometimes it's hard to keep good form even when you're focusing on it, especially when you have various terrain. And I I run in the mountains yeah. and stuff a lot, inspired by you actually, which we'll get into. And um, but anyway, so it's it's funny because I agree with what you're saying. At the same time, that's not the way it works for me actually. So, yeah. so uh, which ultra is they sending you? Um, uh, Olympus, I think that's the one that has a little bit of rubber on the bottom, yeah. right? Yeah, one of my favorite shoes. One of my favorite shoes at the moment. Go ahead. Uh, one of my favorite shoes, the uh, Ultra Olympus. It it works very well. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's kind of shoes. Um. You were also asking about general equipment for ultras. Yeah, yeah. Go so, ahead and go into that. So, um, it's not that different from any other running. Um, just things become a little bit more critical. Uh, blisters become an issue. You know, some people can suffer from blisters at the marathon, um, but once you get up into the 50, 100 mile range, they do become a lot more prevalent. Um, just from sweat so, running down your legs, right? I mean, uh, yeah, your feet are wet. Um, uh, a lot of blister problems, I suspect, are from biomechanical problems. People not landing softly enough. If you've got any uh, um, scraping when you land, that shearing force is going to transmit to your skin. Um, so uh, the best um, salt combination I've come across, and that does make a big difference, is... Uh, an Injinji liner, um, not a the full thickness Injinji, the very thinnest one they do, mm -hmm. and then a right sock, which is a dual layer sock over the top. Mm -hmm. So that's actually three la three very very thin layers of sock. Um, each one can move independently. Yeah, so that's... that has worked really well for me. I'm very um, on board with uh, the Injinji thing, even the regular Injinji socks. I I wear them almost exclusively just because. You know, training, I don't want blisters. You know, if, if you get a blister in a race, you have time to recover. But training for the race, blisters are a, are a pain in the butt. <laughs> yeah. The thing to remember with the Injinji is they only help on the toes. Mm -hmm. Other than the toes, they're just an ordinary sock. Yeah. So it really depends on where you get the blisters. And um, I've worked some aid stations, so you see blisters in, in most parts of the foot. Um, the other thing is making sure, obviously, the shoes fit properly. Um, you know, sometimes people you see them the, the shoe just isn't fitting the foot correctly um, I cut open the toe box in all of my shoes um, which again helps uh, a lot of problems um, in toe blisters mm -hmm. uh, are you hokers hokers have a horrible toe box yeah um, they do that was one reason why I'm, I actually haven't started wearing a hoka do you even cut the ultras yeah yeah. Now the Ultra has got a wide enough toe box. It doesn't have a high enough toe box. So do you so, cut the front of the toes off? Because I've I've seen 
that it kind of will rub across your toenails sometimes because it's really uh, like thin at the tip? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I cut away a good chunk of it. I generally leave a little strip between the main shoe and the, uh, and the very front. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but you can cut the whole lot off. And I have on at least one whole, uh, one whole truck cut off the, the entire toe box. And uh, interestingly, running, I uh, have almost never got any debris in from the <laughs> that, that was my next question. <laughs> How do you keep stuff out of there? Um, I have never had a problem. Uh, walking, you can have a problem. Walking on gravel particularly. But it, it's interesting uh, that I, I've never had a problem. The only time I'll get something in my uh, shoe is something like long grass or brambles or something where it's actually literally your, your foot's running through something. Uh -huh. uh, so, yeah, because um, I was expecting to get all sorts of junk in there. And uh, no, not a problem. I, you know, I have to say after seeing you do that, that's probably the only reason I haven't done that because I figured I would get a bunch of crap in my shoes. And, <laughs> and just... Never had an issue in, mm. in all the thousands of miles I've been doing it. So the easy thing is when you get a pair of shoes that's ready to chuck out, try cutting the toe box open and run for a few miles, you so, know, particularly on a short, easy run. Do you have any problems with that changing the way that the, the shoe supports you? No, no. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I've never been able to detect the difference. And as far as I can tell, it doesn't. Um, it, it doesn't seem to make any difference at all to the way that the shoe moves or uh, uh, behaves. Mm -hmm. So okay. So do you, I, I guess uh, for uh, one one because we're kind of still in shoes, I guess here. Would you recommend that yeah. somebody go to like a, a good running shop and you know get a get looked at on a treadmill to see you know what shoes are good for them, or would you just kind of say go by feel? Because I know that I've had shoes like the, like there's a few pair of Nike shoes that um, I've put on and was like, wow, this is the shoe for me. And then I've been videotaped in the shoe and it's just I'm just squirrely all over the place in this shoe showing that uh, I needed more support. Yeah, that, that, that's kind of a hard one. I, a lot will depend on who you get in a running store. Mm -hmm. um, I think the ability to analyze someone's biomechanics is not trivial, particularly without um, uh, better sensor data than just a slow motion video. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a standard video camera is fairly useless because it, it, doesn't, it doesn't have the frame rate. Something like a GoPro will have a, a high speed mo uh, mode which can actually get some slightly better data. Um, but even then, the science that says pronation is bad and you need to control pronation um, is really flaky at best. There's very little evidence to suggest that uh, controlling pronation helps prevent injuries. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're in a, a world where we e don't even have like enough. in a, even in extreme cases. Like I know this yeah. one guy. He's done a lot of ultra distance stuff, but he's also had his hips replaced like five times. <laughs> and he's like has this nastiest pronation that I've ever seen in my life. And I'm like, wow, you think maybe you could get some more supportive shoes, bro? <laughs> it's like maybe you wouldn't have to replace your hip every year. <laughs> yeah. Um, we don't have the science to back it up. And, and it's certainly only something you, uh, someone could try. Mm -hmm. Um but typically, when you start controlling the motion in the foot, you're, you're changing the stress, um, and that stress on the kinetic chain, the whole body, mm -hmm. I, I don't know how to predict what would happen there. And the science doesn't seem to support it at the moment. Yeah. So um, it, it's hard to say, and I'd, I'd, I'd obviously like to be able to recommend local running stores, and it's a, a, a great institution. Um, my experience with buying shoes at a running store, I've generally done better buying randomly online. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, buying online, I can try the shoes at home for a day or two, just wander around and see if they really do fit, how they how they work. Um, and that 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 seems to work better for me. Yeah, if not, send them back. You know, something like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, 
Now, one thing we've not talked about, um, and I should have brought it up earlier, is cadence. Uh, how quickly your feet turn over and touch the ground. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that appears to be more significant in terms of um, improving your running efficiency and avoiding injury probably than any single other thing. Yeah, before the, the first recording cut off, I was that was one thing I was going to get into. You know, these people that first start out running and they're doing this just crashing in and they have these cadences that are super low but yeah. we'll, we'll have to re-record that part and yeah. then uh, splice it together yeah um so cadence is is the the biggest uh tip that i give people mm -hmm. if you can get your cadence up to about 180 steps a minute um all sorts of other biomechanical problems seem to naturally sort themselves out mm -hmm. people don't overstride so much uh people don't heel strike so much um, people tend to naturally have a slight forward lean. Um, just by getting the cadence right, lots of other things fit into place. So um, this is where some of the science that we do have, and there's not much, around pronation and shoes. You have to worry about the fact that uh, it's quite possible that things will be better just by improving cadence rather yeah. than playing length with shoes. Yeah, I would I would definitely agree with that. Because you, if you got a quick step, I mean, there's you're definitely not overstriding and, and you're yeah. you know, landing on the balls of your feet a little bit more and, and all that. Yeah. I have a hard time staying around 90 or 180, but um, I'm not much below that. I'm usually above 85. I think I see most of the time um, I'm somewhere around like 87 or so, so... Which, yeah. uh, I suppose that's pretty close. <laughs> it, it comes and goes for me, and the heavier the shoe, the harder it is to have a good cadence. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I guess the, the, way, the fact that different. I wore, wear a little bit more supportive shoe and sometimes a, a shoe that I can get a little bit higher mileage out of, maybe that's that extra weight's slowing me down a little bit on that. Yeah. And, and the fact that I have a little bit more cushioning and I can kind of crash in there a little bit more. Right. Right. Okay, let me, um, I'm going to stop this one real quick and then we'll go on to the clothing thing.